her ideas of Laredo, what she looks forward to in the future, and why. Uh, all the big rust about the street over there in Bartlett. <laughs> good morning, Council. Hi, How good you morning. Bien, bien. Thank you very let's, much let's for inviting me. No, no, thank, no, thank you for coming. Um, number one, why? let's talk about who is Nelly Vilma. Well, um, a mom, a okay. five. Um, I've been uh, in several positions here. I've been a teacher. I've been a counselor at MHMR. Um, I've been a prosecutor, I'm a business owner, I'm an attorney, and ultimately an advocate for people. Okay. And why did you decide to run? What was the big change of heart? Was it? Because I got tired of complaining and I said, if, if not me, then who's going to run? I kept on asking, knocking on doors and seeing who was going to run, and I saw that nobody was going to do it, so I decided to do it. Oh, thank you for doing mm -hmm. Thank you for stepping up. Thank you. Okay. And... Um, so you're an attorney. What kind of attorney are you and do you specialize in? I do uh, uh, about 60% of my practice is immigration and I also do um, uh, civil and criminal uh, defense as well since I used to be a prosecutor to the other side. And a lot of the times it comes into complex situations where you need to do a little bit of, of everything. everything. Um, I do uh, investor visas as well. So I bring in a lot of, of um, new uh, in environments for Laredo, like new investors, new businesses that I try to bring into the city as well. Okay, and that's a good that uh, that's maybe we can ask a couple of questions because we have a lot mm -hmm. of changes going on in the near future, especially with immigration and yeah, so on and so true. forth. Yes. And um, where do you see Laredo going? How do you see Laredo growing? Well, I'm very uh, excited about a lot of, of the news now that I'm, I'm in this side of the of the aisle looking at all the possibilities. Uh, of course, we have to be careful of how much we you, we get into, you know, not to promise too much, but to be able to accomplish. Uh, for example, this week we had the, the possibility of becoming a World Trade Center. That is an awesome, awesome news for Laredo because as it is, we are the number one inland port, which I didn't know before being in office. Uh, and just going to, to visit in the legislative sessions that we've gone to Austin and we've gone to Washington, I realized that a lot of them don't have a clue of where Laredo is, what our numbers are, how much percentage of the gross product that comes into the U.S. comes through Laredo. We had a very good presentation, which is kind of like um, the arteries that come from Laredo and it's a GPS uh, I think it was I want to say a thousand trucks or more that they put uh, of our, all the 18 wheelers that cross through Laredo and little by little you start seeing the red lines of all the highways all the arteries that Laredo feeds into and within a week we were all over the US taking course, all the yeah, products of course. so uh, many of the, the people like for example one of the the top notch uh, uh, Congresspersons that, that are in the state uh, in the border security issues hadn't been to Laredo, but yet they're making decisions as to how much funding to allocate. And so that's why we're trying to bring in the perspective from our city, you know, how much we need this, how much we don't want a wall, uh, how that will interfere just with our neighboring relationship with Mexico, how much we have this dependency. Our economy depends on both. You know, we're affected when the peso devaluates and we don't want our downtown to close any more shops, you know, like we've seen. So we have to have a good balance and, and, and try to have growth and not put all our eggs in one basket, have to diversify the economy. And, and so that's why we're looking at other avenues of growth for Laredo. You talked about um, the legis some, some of the legislatures that were trying to put together the security of the wall. Correct. They didn't even come to Laredo. No, we invited them. Who, who, <laughs> yes. who, who are those that are all together and they're involved? Is it just, is it a committee? Is it? Yes. Is it a committee of both Republicans, Democrats, or is Correct. it just one? So yes. it's a little dos on both, on both levels, at the state and at the federal level, we realized, of course, it, there's committees, but uh, the ones having to do with border security, a lot of them were not aware of how vital it is for us to have a good uh, communication. You know, I believe in security. Mm -hmm. I believe in pre preventing yes. the future. Okay. I'm for better security. I'm all for for a wall. If we need it, put it. Mm -hmm. If we don't need it, don't put it. Now, yes. Texas has huge difference in terrain. Yes. So to spend the money for the type of wall that is needed, it's going to overbearing. But now you have 
Southern California and Arizona and New Mexico where you need a wall. Correct. Or a yeah. fence or a better structure. But yes. The, yes, that, yeah. yes. And, and so, and you know, so on parts like that, you need it. Yes, and parts like that makes sense. Like here, for example, we had a meeting with Congressman Coyar, and we had people also from Zapata. Like, how are we going to stop, you know, the flow of the Zapata Lake, for example? You know, they, they need to look at the oh, terrain. I miss that. Yes, I miss that. I miss that also, the Rio. So there's a lot of areas where it doesn't make sense. The Big Bend, like, hello, you're not going to put a wall there, you know? But <laughs> you know have, you, have you been over there? Yes, yes. It's, it's, there. it's, it's it's awesome. It's awesome. And the, well, you can't. The terrain wise, what, what are you going to do? Nothing. Yes, and, and so. it, it messes up the ecology. It messes up everything, you know, for our, uh, uh, you know, livestock as well. So they need to take a lot of things into consideration, not just the wimp of somebody saying, I want a wall. Um, I understand, like, for example, in Yuma, and I did travel with the city about, I want to say, a month and a half ago to the same facility that President Trump visited uh, last week. We went there because we're trying to bring in an expansion here for the uh, Air Marine, sure. which is the backup operations for Border Patrol and, and CBP. And uh, they're here, but they're kind of crowded, and we need funding. We need to try to uh, have more of the helicopter run uh, operations that they do. And so this was the, the prime location, and we went to Yuma, and, and we're trying to, to see if we can have allocations for that as well, which will bring in more jobs as well. Um, that's exactly right, because uh, more of the helicopters, more of that aerial surveillance is what's actually needed. More yes. boots, on, boots on the ground. Boots actually. on the ground. That's what we said when we went to if Washington <coughs> and Austin, that that will be uh, having a virtual wall, which is what we want to call our concept of having the paved road along the, the Vega, having the sensors, the cameras, the drones, the you know helicopters, is going to be a multiplier of force that is going to be cheaper and it's going to make more sense. And it's still, I mean, if they put a road you're still going into people's property. You're still doing all that Correct. stuff, and it's still going to come mm -hmm. into that. So with eminent domain, they're going to get taken anyway. Yes. So folks that live on the river better get used to it because, you know, that something's going to happen. Yes. And, um, and that security is needed. If we save one kid from getting into drugs, of it's well spent. Yes. And, for example, uh, Council Member Algal was mentioning some of the areas in his district from the Father Magnabo to another area there's no connecting no, uh, line. No. So then let's say you caught somebody with drugs, they went into the brush, and how do you find them? You have to go all the way around. By that time, they already skirted into a go. house yeah. or back to Mexico. So it makes sense as far as the enforcement side of it to have the visibility, and that would be better you know, for security purposes as well. Excellent. Now let's touch base on another issue that's been around, and, and, uh, and I'll bring it up. Bartlett, what happened with Bartlett? Because... Two, uh, a couple of shows ago, we had uh, Mr. Channel Dete, mm -hmm. and we had um, Mercurio Martinez III, who was a committee chair of, uh, of transportation and safety. Okay. And they were saying it was just decided one day. Mm -hmm. Nobody, and I was the first one that said, we're not blaming you. Mm -hmm. I blame directors and departments. And the reason I blame directors and departments is this. We can have a council woman or man enter council member <laughs> gender neutral <laughs> gender neutral well okay council member and uh you get you get them for four years mm -hmm. and they're still going to be there mm -hmm. eight years till yesterday so you have a bunch of these de facto little chiefs if you want to put them that way mm -hmm. that have been there 20 years yeah. 15 years 20 25 years and they still are not out and they go with the same type of thing oh, God, no one I've had We'll do our own thing. Mm -hmm. What actually happened? Well, there, what happened uh, back in January, I think, uh, one of the first things that, since I live in the district and I, I have that triangle of dropping off kids in that area, uh, the big need was a, a light at Gill and uh, Thomas. And so I had requested that back in the uh, city council in January 26, 27, around there. And together with that, I was asking for uh, the, the improvement of the flow for, for Bartlett. So the, what was approved at that city council meeting was the light for uh, Bartlett at Gill and the light for Bartlett at Carlton. And so I, I didn't know that it takes a while to do all these things. You know, I come from the business side where I want things done yesterday, and so it's, it's uh, the bureaucracy of things, right? But also, um, once we were able to get that light into place, 
uh, the, the traffic department director, which is traffic and safety department director, was looking also at the information provided by the Federal Highway Administration Department, who conducted a, a two-year study of Laredo and the accident data, which okay. is posted at, at the City of Laredo website on, on my section. I posted all, all the Bartlett data as far as crash accidents. Okay. So. Um, this was this didn't go through council or anything. This was just a decision that Mr. Murillo uh, did to create a protected lane, and we had had I think I don't remember the month, but it was already during my term. We had an accident involving uh, um, an ambulance okay. at the corner of Bustamante and Bartlett. So it's the lifeline of Laredo. I mean, many times when you drive through Bartlett, there's an ambulance and you have to move out of the way. And so um, it's important to have that protected uh, lane because as he explained in, in the most recent meeting that, that they had with the traffic department committee, that's what it's called a yellow trap in the traffic uh, engineering terms. So basically you don't have a protected lane, the, the line in front of you doesn't know where you're going and that's gonna cause an accident. So he decided to have a yellow um, designated protected lane and that one coincided all the way to Jackman because Jackman already has that. So they decided to print the yellow line all along so that we wouldn't have this weaving in and out and causing other accidents because whenever people were gonna turn, let's say they were gonna turn to the VA clinic, well, they will stop in the middle of the road and they, they will have rear ends or they were gonna stop at, uh, you know, at another intersection. So that's why they decided to run it all, all the way to Jackman because that was the alignment already of a turning lane. Now, uh, in the process and listening also to the constituents' uh, request, I did ask them to re-evaluate and monitor, and I will go on my lunch hour, I will be videotaping at the corners when all these changes were done, sending emails to the appropriate departments, and I did ask for them to re-evaluate uh, that turning lane. So as of last week, or no, the week before, they uh, took off the, that turning lane to nowhere that was called, uh, which was from after Hillside, and all the way to Jackman, except at the corners where there is already the, the light, like at the at the park, you know, that park like you still have to go into the protected lane so people know where you're going. Uh, but the other one beyond the park and going to, to Jackman, that one's back to the two lanes. Now, last week I had a couple of meetings again, and, and I keep on monitoring, and, and that's one thing that, uh, from talking to, to the people like Mr. Alderete, the last time I told him I keep on monitoring, I'm gonna continue to monitor, he's like, you're lying. I'm like, monitoring doesn't mean lying. Monitoring means I'm looking at it. I'm not an expert <coughs> in this field. I'm not a traffic engineer. You know, that's not one of my degrees, unfortunately, and they made fun of about that in, in, in Facebook. But I'm gonna uh, listen to the experts in the field because I don't have that expertise. So what happened uh, this last week, I was asking them also about the visibility, because I drop off my son at Harmony, I get at Carlton and Bartlett, and there's no visibility. The the, the fence of the school uh, coming westbound affects the, dis the the visibility. So they're looking at that, at, at having to move the fence back. So then little Foquito goes off, and I said, okay, if we're gonna move the fence back, can we open it up, which now I found out in the engineering terms means flare out the corner. <laughs> so we're looking at that and they said, as a matter of fact, there was a previous uh, study that we had done, I don't know how many years ago, like eight, 10 years ago, let me pull that out. Because if you notice on Sandman, like right after San Martin, mm -hmm. they had started to widen and then it stopped. Mm -hmm. So I'm hoping that we can widen that corner and, and leave intact a, a middle box for turning once mm -hmm. we get that light. Um, in the meantime, and continue to monitor in the, the, the process, there's been people that still make a stop, like we're, we're creatures of habit and we're still making that stop, and that was, there was some near accidents. So for safety purposes, uh, they decided to put back the, the stop light, and that I was you know, in agreement with that because we don't want any accidents, uh, and also because they need to start working on the light. So there's a lot of things that, uh, like I mentioned, like. I think it can be done right away and it can't. There's a lot of things that need to go underground as far as all the lines for, for the lighting. Uh, oh, there were several months also a process of getting the, the right of way for the, for the right lane, right turning lane at Carlton going south. And that I'm trying to see if we can expand it because as they explained to me last week, if I'm asking for this flare, we need to have enough room on the side of that empty road 
so that there's kind of it's called like a box for the for the cars that are going to turn so this is the the next process that is coming that light and then ultimately uh, the the synchronization of the lights from the Correct. Bustamante <coughs> there all the way to Jackman. Uh, yeah. So basically, Murillo is the director's name. Mur Mr. Murillo made that decision, and uh, you know he's the expert in the field. He looked at the data, which is it was the fifth highest crash. Um, Correct. Uh, no, no, no. Know, that's understood. Does Murillo have to go before a committee before he makes a change, or can he just do the changes by himself? The I don't know exactly. I know that the committees are advisory, and ultimately it goes to city council. But there is some things that have not gone to committee, and and so for that I learned from my predecessor. For example, the median that was uh, Wyoming and McPherson in front of Sonic, which were, I was also blamed for taking it off. Which nada que ver. I did not make any decisions there. Um, that one didn't even go through council. Okay, even though there was money spent on that median. Uh, but I did dig up and got information about it. The recommendation from Mr. Murillo was 100 feet median, but that would have interfered with the exit from that business, from Sonic. So the former council member decided to cut it to about 60 uh, feet. That didn't, uh, that didn't serve the purpose because it was also placed at the corner. So you have adjacent traffic from two streets and in the middle, so you're not really protecting the children that are crossing there. Uh, so what I had done is I sent an email to Mr. Murillo and I said I have several people complaining that there's been more accidents after the median, mm -hmm. which in fact was validated. He sent mm -hmm. me an email afterwards. And I said, can you please check into that or check what adjustments need to be done for that crossing? Within two weeks, I started getting calls that, oh, thank you for taking off the median. And I didn't make any decisions. It didn't come before city council. But their department is traffic and safety. So if they go and look at the numbers and there's all these accidents that were caused by it, I don't think they need to, you know, make all, all this havoc and they, they need to remediate the, the problem. So that's what they did. And I think that's wh why that decision was done as far as the, the turning lane for safety. I think safety should prevail in all the decisions that are made. Okay, excellent. But it still has to go to council eventually. Uh, some of the things have to go so to council, can, others don't. don't because we don't micromanage as far as the... the the charter, uh, I can't even go directly to tell Mr. Murillo do, do X they, because no, that's, course, that's the course, city manager, right? So whatever they do, it's, it's with approval of the city manager. If it's something that, that is outside their budget or that they need a, additional approval, then that's then when it, it comes, comes to, to council. To to yes. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you for explaining. Thank you. And thank you for explaining. Here's goes another, another one. Mm -hmm. We live in the border. Mm -hmm. We have, all of us have family in Nuevo Laredo. Uh, majority, you know. We have a lot of kids that are here, born here. The parents were born of, in Mexico. They never became citizens. They're mm -hmm. still here. Mm -hmm. How are these laws going to affect it? Now, <clears throat> we have a couple of laws coming up here in Texas, right? The SB4. SB4. Mm -hmm. it, it takes effect this Friday. And uh, what, explain the immigration law, federal immigration law, because mm -hmm. that's your federal you're an immigration attorney. Mm -hmm. What does it state there? If a person comes in here legally, what has to happen to that person if he gets caught or deported or illegally? Illegally. Okay. Under <coughs> the federal immigration, if a person has come here illegally, uh, it depends on the situation and it depends if the reason why they came or if they have any other relief, that's what we call it in deportation court. Okay. So let's say, for example, that I came here illegally because they shot my husband or they raped my daughter or something like that, then I can ask and seek asylum Excellent. or refugee, then I'm fine. Uh, it could be other victims of, of different crimes, and that, that's a, another area of the law that, that provides protections. But we still need to go uh, through a judge to, to a or judge. an administrative process. There's other... Um, persons in the in the country that if they entered illegally but they had been petitioned before or they're married to a US citizen or a resident or have a child that is a US citizen or a resident, they qualify with an immigration judge. If they have been here for over ten years and they don't have any criminal record, they may qualify for a reprieve which will be a cancellation of a removal proceeding mm -hmm. um, if they have this good moral character. Uh, under the federal criminal side of it, there is, uh, it's a crime. Like I tell my clients, es, es un crimen pisar sacate, you know. It's, it's a crime just to come in illegally. And it could be a misdemeanor, which is an illegal entry, and Correct. it's a federal crime. 
and it's punishable, I think, uh, I think it's up to a year. And, or it could be a felony. If they have a previous removal or deportation by a judge and they come back to the states, it's up to about 72 months. And I think there were some other increases with the recent uh, changes in the, in the punishment uh, sentencing. So it is a very serious uh, offense. offense. Mm -hmm. Now, here living in, in the border, mm -hmm. we know that there's a drug war going on for many years. Of course. When many families come here, and they can they seek asylum? Yes. And no, depending on who you ask, okay? And this is more of a political stance because if you go with anybody that that is going to be representing Mexico, we are not in a political ambience where we're going to admit that there is a problem, okay? And the, in other words, the Mexican government's not going to admit that there's a problem. Correct. Oh, of course. So then a lot of people seek uh, help in, the, in that regard, and they're going to be denied. But if you come uh, to the U.S. and you provide proof, which is also very difficult because, as you know, if, if something sure. happened in Mexico, they can't call the police. They can't make a report. Yeah. And the immigration judge, that's what they want to see, that you made a report, that there is some proof, and, and so it's very it's difficult. It's not going to happen. Mm -hmm. And it's not, it doesn't happen in people that were in Bosnia that were over here. Correct. They're not going to happen with the yes. guys in Syria that are going to over here as well. Yes. You know? We just, you know, who? In fact, that's worse. Yes. Who knows what? You know yeah. what I'm saying? But here in... In Nuevo Laredo, there's a lot of families, there's a lot of businesses that were affected by that. Of course. And now they're here, mm -hmm. many. Yes. And, um, you know, everybody, I guess in the early, in this part of the century, you know, two th in 2004 to about 2008, everybody yeah. was running from the setas, everybody was here. That's true. All mm -hmm. the businesses, boom, todos vinieron para acá. Yeah. I remember. And uh, they were get, being extorted over there, so on and so forth. Correct. Could those people get the asylum because of that? Well, <coughs> what we do with a lot of those businesses, they have qualified either for an L visa, which means if you had another, like the the mother uh, business mm -hmm. over there and you come and do a, a, an affiliate or subsidiary, then you qualify for an L visa. Uh, some of them qualify under the NAFTA, which is also under threat right now. You know, Tratado Libre Comercio, we've been able to bring a lot of accountants to businesses locally, a lot of IT personnel. Uh, people that, that have the qualifications. It could be that you studied in Mexico, Canada, or the U.S. You qualify under NAFTA. Uh, and some people, if they do have uh, documentation of, and of this type of abuse, or, I mean, they killed your, your relative or they kidnapped you and things like that, then they can have ample proof to uh, be able to, to get Fall an, into an that asylum. Mm -hmm. And an asylum can be done affirmatively as long as it's filed within less than one year of, of okay. getting okay. into the U.S., or it could be done with an immigration court, and it, if it's beyond the one year, then we go into withholding or, uh, uh, what's it, convention against torture as okay. well. Okay, okay, mm -hmm. okay. And because that, that, is, that is very much prevalent, especially here on the border. Yes. And, uh, one of the things that we need to clarify, though, and I did last year, uh, with when uh, C-SPAN um, Washington Journal came to Laredo, uh -huh. I uh, clarified a lot of the myths because this is, what affects us nationwide, you know, that they're looking at, oh, it's Mexico, all the illegals are here from Mexico, and it's not true. Uh, we there's a lot of illegals from yeah, all other countries. There's a lot of illegals from, from other countries, you know, and it, so. There's, there's Canadian families here that have been here illegally for many, a very long time. That's you, right. Only because they have blonde hair, blue eyes, and run around back and forth. Correct. You know? Yes, we have from Asia, from Canada, from Europe. Everywhere. Everywhere, but we are the ones pretty much in the postcard of, of yeah. illegal. <laughs> but there's no law that that is now that says, let's sec let's segregate or separate Mexicans because Mexicans are there under federal law, right? No, but uh, let's look at the SB4, for example. Who do you think they're going to stop and ask for papers? Somebody well, that's blonde and, and blue eyes or somebody that's our color of well, skin? But they do that anyway. I mean, we grew up with that. The border patrol is in Donde Eres. You know, where are you from? You got them guys in the mall and the bicycle telling people outside down the edges. You know, yes. it's a, so profiling, please. So, um, that's Yeah, I've been working with that. You know, we've been, we, we, live, we live with that, you know? you know? But, but now let's look at the whole of Texas. So it's you go the same more thing, or the, Texas. you know, the panhandle or you go to Dallas. I mean, my husband oh, went to, to college in Dallas and right. there was still an era in the 80s where Mexicans were not served at several yeah, restaurants. Believe me, I went, I, went, I, went, I, went, I went through the whole thing. I remember in mm -hmm. college, I'll tell you, when did you come here? When did your family arrive? Well, to, to the United States. Well, my family didn't arrive to the United States. 
the United mm -hmm. States arrived to my family. Yes. <laughs> you know, yes. they came this way. <laughs> <laughs> come you know, the I didn't come to the United States. States. <laughs> the United States came to came my family. To me. Eight of but the states. That's, yes. you know, mm -hmm. But that's the way. That's the way it is. You know. And, and that's one thing that, that also, too. yeah, that that history is something that we need to relate to our children because many times they lack those roots and they don't know mm -hmm. how to defend and they think, oh yeah, it's true what we hear in the mainstream no. media. You know, but they need to know their roots as well. And um, you know, Texas has, you know, we had a bunch of Latinos, mm -hmm. but we had that we were called Texicans. A yes. lot of people didn't know that, <laughs> yes. and even the blonde eye, blue eyes were called Texicans up until. The Hollywood movie in '45, which is called The Texan. Okay. In serio. I didn't Después know. Después de eso, todos eran Texan, and then all of a sudden, somos Texanos, you know. So. Yes. I wish I could take the class that Dr. Thompson is giving at Tamu with all the history, but I just can't this semester. <laughs> <laughs> no, he's a good man. Yes. But you know, so it's it's interesting how mm -hmm. it is, you know. Pero here goes another one. What's that before? As before is uh, the law that that took effect and that is starting That's why on, it took effect. on well. Well, it was 1st. passed, but it's going to take effect this Friday, September the 1st, whereby the uh, detention uh, detainer that ICE uh, requests has to be abided by by any uh, law enforcement agency if, if the person is, is in the jail, which we're already doing with security it's already communities. There anyway. It's already there. The thing that expands is that they have to ask for immigration status. Any law enforcement uh, agent and even campus police has that right starting on Friday to ask for immigration status if they have somebody detained, not even arrested, detained, they can, they can ask. They can ask. But and they, so... They, but they kind of did that anyway, you know, the police kind of did do that anyway. Some of them did, but, but it was you know, not... You know, it was uh, discretion, they can ask. I mean, it's still a crime. But that's not their purview or jurisdiction, you, you know? know? And, and, uh, and so that now it makes it legal. But then you have some rogue agent that, you know, could take it further. And what, what this law does is that uh, once it takes effect, we cannot legislate against it. We cannot put any boundaries. We cannot put any stop or any type of, of policies regarding immigration enforcement. So that's where our hands are going to be cut starting on Friday. As a city, uh, you know, sheriffs, police, government, we cannot even change policy. And what, what this law has is that it has more teeth than the Arizona Show Me Your Papers law because it uh, it's going to call for a Class A misdemeanor if anybody doesn't follow it. Uh, it could be the police chief, it could be the sheriff or anybody else. And also elected officials, if we try to make any policy against it, we could lose our seats, which is, I think, an affront on democracy because Talk, that... Well, what do you mean, lose your seat? So if you're opposed, you can lose your seat? Yes. Because that's an affront, I think, on democracy. Uh, who's going to fight for the rights of the people that are going to be targeted by well, racial so, profiling? Well, racial profiling is one thing. Mm -hmm. um, protecting law-abiding citizens is another. And that should be the Legal priority. Legal citizens, right? That, that should, should be, be the, the priority, priority now, but it's not going to We're not be. supposed to be taking care of, if you're an illegal, you already committed a crime. Correct. So you understand mm -hmm. what I'm saying? So now we have to decipher where is it, like you were explaining, did it go into... Are you here because you need to be here? Are you here because you're asylum, because you're going through the problems? That, mm -hmm. Then we have to protect those. You know, and, I think there's a humanitarian yes. right to that. Mm -hmm. But um, I see this. At the ranch one years ago, we, we found a young illegal. He ended up breaking his leg. And we started helping. We called mm -hmm. Border Patrol. Border Patrol agents arrived. We were evidence of Ala County. And they said, they started asking him, did they hit you? Did they break you? Wait a I minute, mean, we're helping him. Mm -hmm. So we almost got into trouble. Mm -hmm. My father's a physician, he told me, you know, the Good Samaritan law, I'm telling you, uh, that sheriff arrived. And he said, from now on, just call us. And I've found half dead. Mm -hmm. I found some that are lost beyond belief. Mm -hmm. I found a couple that were from Brazil. One of them had been bitten by fire and so bad that he couldn't walk anymore. Mm -hmm. And I will call the sheriff. I won't call the Border Patrol. I will call the sheriff. Why? Because the sheriffs will give them more help than what the Border Patrol actually does. Mm -hmm. Okay? And um, why? Because that's what they're looking for. And I didn't know that we were in a line where a lot of the neighbors, that's how they live, they pick up uh, the illegals and they take them to San Antonio and so on and so mm -hmm. forth. And okay. la di la di la yeah. you know? Yeah. yeah, well, my issue with this enforcement from the 
uh, sheriff, uh, PD, campus police perspective is that they don't have the training as to what is a proper immigration document or status or who may or may not qualify. They could be a victim or not, or they could be under a temporary status. So who's going to train them to know and make the difference, and know how to make the difference and to avoid litigation for us because now we're going to be at risk of stopping a U.S. citizen and detaining them just because they don't have the papers or somebody that actually had their documents. That's, that's why that's the purview of the feds. They're the ones that are trained. They go to an academy of months long to learn about immigration. But believe me, what you just said, I'm mm -hmm. pretty sure within the next month you're going to have a lot of classes being taught, especially for these mm -hmm. and these officers. After the fact, in fact, so after, yes. you know, so <laughs> believe, believe me, <laughs> there's going to uh, there's going to be yes. a lot of training going mm -hmm. on more so yes, than yes, you believe. I, of course, <laughs> yeah, I've so, prepared a training so and I've done it a few <laughs> times, but I'm I'm hopeful still that some of it will <laughs> be ruled unconstitutional. And, and some of, some of the guys, you know, um, what gets me is this: I think we have a lot of border patrol here, uh -huh. and everybody has. Uh, some help at the house. A lot of them are illegal. And even the Border Patrol has them, you know. Mm -hmm. There's a hypocrisy. Yes. That I just don't, I don't see, you know. Yeah. Either we're going to do it right or don't do it at all. Yes. And, and then prioritizing also, like you were mentioning, the, the crimes. Because if, if PD is going to be now stuck with checking papers and doing the work for the feds, then when are they going to be able to investigate and, and do the protection of our city? You, you, know, you know what should residents. happen? And you just throw it back at the feds, you mm -hmm. know. They get a stop car. Oh, he doesn't have them, but he does the thing. Call the feds. Adios. Mm -hmm. Leave. That's what's going to start happening. Well, PD's going to stop, and then they're going to call Border Patrol, like they usually do, and then all of a sudden it's going to and, that, and that's the issue with a lot of mistakes. I mean, just in my little practice, within the last five years or so, I started keeping uh, records. And I have over, I want to say, for this month, hopefully they, they approve two more, I have about 22 people that were deported unlawfully because they were actually U.S. citizens. But immigration is quote-unquote civil, so you don't get an attorney when you're detained in a pseudo-jail, but it's a civil detention. So a lot of people don't know how to look for their ancestry or know that they have this right to citizenship. And uh, I've had, in my experience, at yeah. least 22 people Easy. that those mistakes were done by people that were trained and even by judges of immigration. So I anticipate a lot of mistakes. I understood. Let me tell you this. I'm 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 married to mm -hmm. a Brazilian. She's immigrating in here. We're going through the whole process. Mm -hmm. So, do it correctly. Yeah. Number one. I don't like this. That I've been living here 30 years. I have a great. All my children are U.S. citizens. This whole so blah 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 blah. And all of a sudden you get detained and you're getting deported, mm -hmm. and you have an excellent business. You could have paid an attorney to go get this out of the way. Yeah. If they qualify. There's a, there's a, yeah. there's a, there's a how can I put it? There's, if one can do it, anybody should be able to do it. That, that is correct to an extent. It depends on when they try to, to do, do it. it. Okay? Right. Because when I was in law school back in 2001, I graduated, uh, and I was in the immigration clinic since 99, I've been doing immigration. Uh, I realized, and I, that's why I switched gears to immigration, I realized that there were a lot of laws that are ex post facto because they're not citizens, so they can be retroactively affecting somebody that might have committed. Maybe I, you know, I had a client, a grandma, that stole uh, jeans and earrings when she was like 17. So now, like 25 years later, she was in deportation because of that mistake, which back then wasn't deportable. But since the law changed, now it's retroactive. And so you have issues like that, or you have issues, for example, of uh, the way that the laws have been um, done. And primarily, I've seen a lot of, of um, I will call it discrimination, <laughs> against Mexico, okay? Mexico, for Mexico example. Is it Mexico or Latin America? Um, and I'll tell you I, why. In a I, will bit. I will say Latin America because they're Western Hemisphere, but in the table of, of visa backlogs, Mexico is the only country from Latin America that is affected since the 70s. So why the law that? changed in 77. We used to have a, a system which was called the Western Hemisphere system. So if I married and want to immigrate my family, everybody comes in, even kids after born, mm -hmm. on the date of my marriage, that's the date that everybody, yeah, let's see, right, right, comes in. But in 77, they changed the law. And so they said, there's this process now because we're going to allocate so many visas per country. Well, of course, if you're next to the U.S., you have a lot of family. Like you said, the, the river divided us. Of course, there's this connectivity. There's going to be a higher 
uh, rate of, of immigration, but yet we don't have a higher number of visas. So we have a backlog, and it, it remained from there. There was a lawsuit where uh, the Silva lawsuit that a lot of people were able to gain their retroactivity. But let's say, for example, when I was in law school, uh, if I, as a legal permanent resident, wanted to petition my spouse or my kids under 21, let's say, you know, the people that came right, from agriculture, right. whatever, they, they turning around time was about seven years, eight years of wait. So might as well get a divorce, you know, you're not gonna last over here working seven or eight years without your wife or your kids. So that's where the problem started trickling in, like, you know, my wife is about to have a child, I wanna have him here, they will bring him in. And that's where our backlogs in the visas created a lot of this problem as well. Now, you know, uh, we have, we deal with a lot of sports. One of, one of my businesses is sports so I'm always inviting people from other countries for martial arts mm -hmm. and I've seen that in South America there's a different perspective on a person applying for a visa to come in in mm -hmm. certain countries mm -hmm. okay in comparison to more welcoming mm, yeah than than France or mm -hmm. in Europe okay and you, in France you don't need well you get a visa just like if I show my passport when I go over there but especially in Brazil, you have to get a tourist visa. Mm -hmm. Okay. Now, what I've seen, some of them, you have to produce that you have money. You have to produce that you have a job. You have to produce that you have, uh, how can I say, property that you're going to go back to. The financial roots. The roots, right. Yes, right? Yes. Mm -hmm. But then you go to, they make it so hard that, you know, Brazil is the size of the United States that they have to go from one town, like say Laredo, and you're, count, you're set to go to the consulate in New York City. Mm -hmm. Well, then you have to pay to go to the consulate in New York City, you take all your documentation, and I'll sh you show it and they say, oh, you're not, you're not. Yeah. okay? Mm -hmm. You didn't make it. Then you start wondering why. Oh, but you didn't make it because you didn't go to this mon monitoring middleman agency Oh, mm -hmm. And I'm pretty sure it happens in Mexico as well. Mm -hmm. You know, in Mexico, if you're if it's in Mexico and we understand that there's there's a corruption level there, things are gonna change a little bit different. Some mm -hmm. people are gonna get in here while they were down here in the bottom of the stack mm -hmm. at a Penta UCM over here while others so. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And that's never going that those problems are not going to change until those managements of those yeah. agencies and I'm talking about the US consulate agencies mm -hmm. are not re evaluated and like Trump says drain the swamp and drain the swamp completely mm -hmm. because I cannot I see a double standard especially for Latinos this is like the like the gentleman from Africa that brought in Ebola he was supposed to six months to get a visa and within 72 hours he was already in Miami mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. understand what I'm saying yeah. and he got it so there's a difference there's a double standard yeah. And until we, until those countries do not stand up, mm -hmm. why is that? Some of them told me, they, they, one of the customers to Chase in Brazil explained to me that the reason Brazil doesn't cross over like France and so on and so forth is because the airports are not suitable mm -hmm. for the security standards of the American aviation. I don't know if that's mm -hmm. true or not. I said, okay, mm -hmm. what have you. Mm -hmm. France is and some of the other countries are. Mm -hmm. Understand what I'm saying? Yeah. Some in Chile, the same thing that happens. We try to bring in a karate instructor from Chile, and the fir first thing, boom, denied, denied, denied. Some don't. Some. Come but in. but yeah. maybe also depends on on why they they're coming. If they they have what is the 214B like? If they have any notion that they might stay or any, it's more of their no. subject. <laughs> I, I think uh, it's more like what what, that, what a lot of people then in Brazil are saying. It's kind of like there's 30 people, and all of a sudden three people show up and. It's kind of like, you know, no, no, yes, you know, no, no, yes, you know, kind of thing. Because we have other types of visas for that, for entertainment, which are the O and the P visas, and it depends on the level of, of uh, their exposure. If they have international acclaim, they're able to come in and, and they're able to stay or come and do a, a you know, a, a an workshop. And go back an or whatever, event, yeah. No, no, that's, like that, that's, so. that's, that's, that's good to know. Mm -hmm. But I think in, in that sense, especially in, Me in Mexico, I think that's where the problem lies. Mm -hmm. If they would just... Guess what? Get rid of everybody there and start from scratch, and yeah. I think a lot of that backlog would change. Yeah, the the, the backlog we have right now it's it's on our side because mm -hmm. we don't have enough, and uh, there's this push for immigration reform, but I think it's it's 
not well supported because it will completely uh, shut off some of the uh, family petitions. And it, it's repetitive of what we already have. We already have investor visas. We already have professional visas. So I think it's just expanding on that. But maybe something like, like uh, Canada is good, a merit system where, you know, you, what are you bringing in and what is your education and you don't have a criminal record, like that gives you extra points, things of that nature, that, that's going to help. Even, for example, the... the the agricultural uh, visas, uh, it's, it's a H2A. Uh, it's usually a push and, you, and the, the farmers go to a different country and they bring people, right? And I thought for the most part that it was working great and I thought, well, this might be expanded and it may very well be expanded under this presidency. But I sat in at the meeting for the um, migrant, Texas Migrant mm -hmm. Council last week and one of them uh, was a farmer, one of the board members, and he was saying, it's very different when you have a farming family that has been there, that knows the fields, that takes care of the pruning carefully, to where you bring, you know, 50 See, people guys in from the, the Guatemala, yeah. whatever, Mexico, whatever country. And they're just, yeah, dijo, you can just pass and you see that one was an H2A field and this one is a family uh, done field. And then again, the, the crime rate in the in the communities that they go to, I mean, it's all single male, male and they're going to be looking for entertainment and there's going to be crime spikes, uh, what have you. So we need to look at that also, that aspect of immigration when we expand some of these visas. It's not just, oh, what's good for the agriculture, you know, it's going to be good, good for the U.S. as well. So there's a lot of balancing acts there as yeah, well. And, and everything, you know, that mm -hmm. what you just said, there's a lot of single males that are going to come in, they're going to be there, is it? Look yeah. what's going on with these refugees from the Middle East. Yes, that's true. You know, there's no vetting process. They're just throwing them in here and wait a minute. Yes. You know? One thing I would like to mention, though, uh, taking ahead. advantage of the space, is the, the DACAs. Uh, the DACA, there's DACA? also uh, deferred action for deferred action for children arrivals. I forget the, the acronym, but it's pretty much the children that came in under 16 illegally to the U.S. that were brought in by their parents, but they don't have status. Some mm -hmm. of them have met have come two months old or five years old, what have you. A lot of and them have grown up. Have grown up here. All that and, is missing and, and is uh, they yeah. pledge allegiance every day, you know, but they yeah. don't have the paper. And and not only that, a lot of them don't speak Spanish. Correct. They've never been to been their to country. A, in, in the, they don't speak Spanish. Mm -hmm. They're, and, and you see them. On, on that sense, if they're here, they're good citizens, so on and so forth, there should be some type of change to correct that mm -hmm. status. Yes. Now, if they're going to remove all those, apparently, you know, you can't. You have a lot of them that have gone into the military. Yes, that's true. They, and, they have, uh, you know, they're excellent. They have, they're excellent soldiers, mm -hmm. been, and a lot of them gave their, their most, which is their life for our freedoms. That's true. And I was under the impression that if you did go to the army you at, at the end of your term you were going to become a u.s citizen that's yes. not the case is it well uh i do have a, a couple of, of boys here from laredo that they came in and they were uh, their family was a victim of violence their mom was a victim of violence so i had gotten them under a u visa and then i was able to get them residency they, but they wanted to give back so badly to the community sure. because they had received you know all these supplies and shoes and everything they were very poor so they thought how can we give back they wanted to join the military and they were denied in several branches until we made them residents they started training uh, with the marines and as soon as they they, uh, they did their their boot camp uh, the day before the graduation they both were sworn in as That's u.s right. citizens Beautiful. and it's a great story that we have you know, i have a student that's been with me off and on and um young young lad now is he's a he's a man now no? and um he was born here in Laredo, to a midwife mm -hmm. born from a midwife the to a what it seems to be of a underage girl mm -hmm. at a time frame when that was not accepted so they took the baby and they gave it to the lady that used to clean the house the maid oh okay mm -hmm. lived here and then she moves back comes back and he went through high school and everything. Tries believing he was a U.S. citizen. He is a U.S. citizen. Was told he was born here. Goes and tries to join the Marines and he said, where's your paperwork? Goes to school. Well, yeah, I was always here. Here's where I went to school. Here's where I went to this. Mm -hmm. They didn't accept him. No. He's married and so on and so forth. Now, they did an investigation. The midwife is, is uh, she's she, deceased. 
the mom that raised him is deceased. Mm. So now he's in a state of limbo that nobody knows what, what, to, he, do. what to do. This, is there any other witnesses? Because in those cases, what I've done is I've delayed birth certificate through court. We go to court and we take the affiance that, that can relay the story, how it happened, and, and there were witnesses to that. So, you know, we've been mm -hmm. trying to pick them up a little bit. Yeah, yeah, that's probably the labor certificate. Uh, one of the things on the DACAs I did post on my on my Facebook via my law firm, some uh, uh, advising, you know, for them because uh, we're on a deadline. The, the lawsuit that was uh, in the Valley against the Obama executive order, there is a, a, an impasse right now, and the, the, loss, the lawsuit deadline is for September the 5th. So Attorney General Paxton and 10 other attorney generals uh, told uh, President Bush pretty much an ultimatum. Bush, either, President you, Trump. I mean, Trump, I'm sorry. Trump an ultimatum uh, to do away with the executive order or they're going to file suit. So it seems like the administration might do away with DACA. And so I'm, 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 I put several uh, scenarios there of how they can uh, try to get assistance or have their emergency planning because we have a lot of these kids. We have a lot of professionals. We even have a doctor, a lawyer, a priest that, that and are that, DACAs and, and, and that's and the that, And if, if you've been here, we need to help them out, number mm -hmm. one, because they've, they've grown up with yeah. us. And they and came through no fault of their own. It's the sins of their fathers and they shouldn't be paying for Understood. that. Understood. Mm -hmm. well, number one, I want to thank you for thank coming Thank you for here. your time. And thank you for explaining this because this is, and hopefully people out there can can understand what everything is going on and mm -hmm. hopefully Bartlett gets resolved and yes put we're a red monitoring put, and we're making changes as needed <laughs> put, a, put a red light do what you have to do there yes. fire who you have to and <laughs> yeah. thank you so much for thank you us. very much i appreciate the, the opportunity and until next time we'll see you here Bye -bye.